Good evening, everybody. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this chilly winter evening. We are delighted to welcome Richard Rothstein to the University of Southern Maine. It's really great to see so many students and staff and faculty and community members in the audience. My name is Libby Bischoff, and I'm the executive director of the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education and a professor of history here at USM. And it's really my delight to welcome you to our annual Matson New York Times lecture, which we have combined this year with USM's fourth annual W.E.B. Du Bois lecture, which was established in 2015-2016 by my colleague, Dr. Leroy Rowe, who you'll hear from in just a second. I give snaps for Leroy every time. Um, the lecture topic is really a fitting one for both of us, um, both for the MAP Library and for the Du Bois Library, hence our decision to bring them together this year. MAPs play, if you've been reading Mr. Rothstein's book, a really essential, central role in the segregation of American cities. And the MAP Library were really deeply committed to the work of educational outreach at all levels, assisting in making our collective history more visible and so we're delighted to have you here tonight. Tonight's lecture is made possible by an endowed lecture fund that was established in 1994 by the New York Times Company Foundation and an anonymous donor to honor the life and career of Walter Matson, who was the chief operating officer and president of the New York Times. And he was a Portland kid. He graduated from Deering in 1949. He did a stint in the Marine Corps and he sought his degree at Portland Junior College and Portland University, USM's predecessors on this very campus. He, like many of our students in this audience, was a veteran. He worked his way through his entire undergraduate education. He was a printer at the Press Herald at night and a student by day. And so he continued in the newspaper business after graduation, picked up an electrical engineering degree along the way, and he began a three-decade career at the New York Times in 1960, um, rising from pro assistant production manager to president and retired in 1993. And so his legacy, which is honored by this lecture series, is a real testament to what a tremendous work ethic and a solid USM education can accomplish. And so we're very grateful to this fund to really make it possible for us to bring in national lecturers to share with our USM community and our greater Portland community. So you're all very welcome here with us. I just have a few thank yous. Um, I want to first and foremost thank USM and Maine Law alumna, Marfine Sean, and current public policy student, and Eric Isley, a current USM graduate student in the Muskie School, because it was their initial work of reaching out and inviting Richard Rothstein to Portland that made this evening truly possible. This is more than a year in the making, and it wouldn't have happened without either one of them. We're grateful to the provost's office for sponsoring the pre-lecture reception. We promise to order double the food for next year. I've never seen food disappear so fast. Um, we are very grateful to USM's Intercultural and Diversity Advisory Committee for purchasing 100 books, which we have put in the library, given out to students, given out to faculty and staff. There are still a few copies left. Hit me up if you need one. Um, and I also am always very conscious and very grateful of the people who really make these events happen. So thank you so much to Hope Mori, who is our administrative a specialist in the Osher Map Library, Nikki LeClaire, the Administrative Specialist in History and Political Science, USM Conferences, Catering, and ITMS for their role in arranging this event. And finally, I would offer a thanks to my friend and colleague, Dr. Lance Gibbs, USM's Talbot Fellow, and my colleague in history for all of his support for this event. So tonight, you are briefly going to hear from Dr. Rowe about the Du Bois Lecture. Eric is going to introduce Mr. Rothstein. Mr. Rothstein will give his lecture. We will have a 15 to 20 minute Q&A period, which will be um, done by these microphones. So if, when Richard is done speaking, if you have a question, you are welcome to line up on either side. We'll take the mics in turn for about 15 minutes. And then after the lecture, he will do a book signing outside in the atrium, um, if there are still more things that you need to say. So it is my pleasure to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Leroy Rowe, Associate Professor of African American History and Politics 
here at USM. Thanks for being with us. So I was warned earlier by my um, academic mother, Libby Bischoff, <laughs> to keep my remarks pretty brief. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I want to just shed light a little on the work that's been done here over the past three to four years to establish a race and ethnic study minor here at USM. And we wanted students to have a better grounding in the historical context about how and why things are the way they are today. And to empower them to be able to believe in themselves that they could also effect change. And we also thought that maybe we should do much more to bring individuals to our campus to engage our students and our entire community on strategies and ways in which institutions and communities can come together and have done that in the past and we can do it in the future to work towards building a better society, one that is accepting and welcoming of all and creates opportunities for all. And it was just fitting that we chose someone who uh, was a trailblazer, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, to be honored with this lecture. Du Bois was the father of the black protest movement, which gave us the black uh, um, liber liber liberation movement, that is the civil rights movement that we all uh, um, know so much about, or, or at least know very little about, <laughs> beyond Martin Luther King, sorry. Um, but W.E.B. Du Bois talked and wrote and marched for civil rights. He insisted upon the first class citizenship for all Americans. And that I mean the right to enjoy full equality of opportunity, dignity, legal rights, and justice regardless of race. Du Bois was committed to combating racial stereotypes with empirical evidence of the economic, social, and cultural conditions of African Americans. Yet. He also believed dismantling racism and segregation required the interracial collaboration between the races. This evening's lecture follow in that vein. Not only will we learn much about the intersection of race and public policy and its consequences upon individuals, families, and communities, but why we should all care enough to do something about correcting those injustices that have been institutionalized and have done so much harm to our society for decades. Thank you. Welcome. Um, my name is Eric Isley. I'm a graduate student in the Muskie School. Um, and I've also been working with students here at USM uh, on issues of structural racism um, and USM's new Goal 10 um, on issues of equity and justice. Um, and so it's my pleasure to welcome Richard Rothstein to be our speaker for tonight. Uh, and before I do, I just want to say that this talk is the first in a series of events, both connected to this book and for any USM students faculty or staff, if you haven't gotten your copy of the USM Common Read, How to Be an Anti-Racist, please stop by the provost's office. Um, and with that, Richard Rothstein resides in California and is a distinguished fellow of Economic Policy Institute and an emeritus senior fellow of the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He's also a senior fellow at the Haas Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. He is most recently the author of the groundbreaking study, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Government Segregated America, published in 2017 by W.W. W. Norton and Co. and long listed for the National Book Award. This powerful and deeply researched book expands upon and provides a national perspective on Rothstein's recent work that has documented the history of state-sponsored residential segregation, as in his report, The Making of Ferguson. He's the author of Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right, and, and Class and Schools, Using Social, Economic, and Educational Reform to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap. He's also the author of The Way We Were, Myths and Realities of America's Student Achievement, other books include The Charter School Dust-Up, Examining the Evidence on Enrollment and Achievement, and All Else Equal, Are Public and Private Schools Different? 
We are excited to welcome Richard Rothstein to the University of Southern Maine this evening to speak to us about the color of law. Please join me in welcoming Richard Rothstein. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> and thanks to all of you for coming here this evening to engage in this conversation with me. Uh, <clears throat> you heard the reference a few minutes ago to the civil rights movement uh, in the 1900s, the 20th century. We had a civil rights movement in this country, a very active civil rights movement. Uh, it began in the 1930s by challenging segregation in law schools because civil rights lawyers thought that if they, if judges couldn't understand anything else, uh, they might be able to figure out you couldn't get a good legal education in an inferior and segregated law school. And then that precedent was used to challenge segregation, racial segregation in colleges and universities. And then in 1954, it led to the Brown versus Board of Education decision that banished legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown decision then gave impetus, inspiration, stimulus to a nascent civil rights movement of activism. People engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives in that struggle. That civil rights movement persuaded much of the country, not everyone, but much of the country that segregation, racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful both to blacks and to whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. And by the end of the 1960s, the activists in the civil rights movement had succeeded in desegregating lunch counters and buses public accommodations of all kinds, interstate transportation. You know this history. <clears throat> Yet at the end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement went home, folded up its tent, left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country, including this one, is racially segregated. Separate areas for African Americans, separate areas for whites. I've lived in many, many metropolitan areas in the course of my life, and every one that I've lived in had rigid racial segregation. How could it be? The country came to understand that racial segregation was wrong, harmful to both blacks and whites, immoral, incompatible with our pride in being a democracy. How could it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Partly, I guess, it's because Undoing residential segregation is hard. If we banish segregation of lunch counters or buses or interstate transportation, the next day you go to any restaurant you want or you sit anywhere you want on a bus. But if you banish segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. It's a tough thing to undo once we've done it. And so what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, myself included, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, blacks, whites, northerners, southerners, is we've adopted an excuse, a national excuse, a rationalization that we give ourselves for failing to undo racial segregation of neighborhoods. And that excuse, that rationalization goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of lunch counters or buses or interstate transportation, any of these things I mentioned, colleges and universities, schools. That was all done by government. It was the product of law, regulation, ordinance, public policy. We understand that if government is doing those things, it's a civil rights violation. If the federal government is embarking on those kinds of policies of segregation, it violates the Fifth Amendment. If state and local governments are doing it, it violates the Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution. And we all understand that if we have a civil rights violation, a violation of our Constitution, we have an obligation to remedy it. It's our obligation as American citizens to do something about it if there's a civil rights violation. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, oh, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. That wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy, by ordinance. That just sort of happened, happened by accident. 
It happened because bigoted white homeowners or landlords wouldn't sell or rent to African Americans in predominantly white neighborhoods or in all white neighborhoods. It happened because actors in the private economy, real estate agents or banks, engaged in discriminatory behavior. Or it happened because blacks and whites just like to live with each other of the same race. Uh, we feel more comfortable that way, and so we self-segregate. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just the result of income differences, something that a result of the way our economy works. Uh, African Americans, on average, have lower incomes than whites, not all of them, but on average. And they can't afford to move to middle-class white neighborhoods. All of these bigoted, perhaps, but individual, non-governmental, private sector choices and decisions is what's created residential segregation. And what happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. It's not a civil rights violation. Government didn't do it. And as such, we, as American citizens, don't have an obligation to do anything about it. We think it's too bad that we have such a segregated society, an apartheid society, but we don't feel any one of us here individually responsible for doing something about it. We give a name to this rationalization. It's a name, again, that all of us use. I'm sure everyone in this room have used it or heard it. We say it's de facto segregation, something that just happened in fact, not in law. Well, as you heard in the introduction, they, Eric read off a bunch of books I wrote about education. I've been around long enough to write a lot of books and get a lot of phony titles. But they were all about education. And in the 1990s and 2000s, I was an education columnist in the New York Times for a while, and I was writing a lot about the dominant education policy in this country, which I thought was wrong, to put it mildly. Uh, our dominant education policy in that country, the dominant problem we were facing was uh, an achievement gap between blacks and whites in schools. And we told ourselves that the reason we had an achievement gap was because teachers had low expectations of black children. Uh, we told ourselves that if only teachers could be made to work harder, try harder, raise their expectations, the achievement gap would disappear. Uh, that may seem silly to you. In retrospect, it seems silly to most people. We passed a law uh, embodying that view. Uh, in 2001, we passed a law called the No Child Left Behind Law, which said that in just seven years, we we're going to abolish the achievement gap, and the way we we're going to do it was by holding teachers to higher standards. That's the way. That was the only way. And uh, it was a, a law that was supported across the political spectrum. It was uh, sponsored by President George Bush in the Senate by the most liberal Democratic senator, Ted Kennedy, in the House by the most liberal uh, congressman, George Miller. And like I say, the law said that in seven years, the achievement gap will disappear just if we test children more and hold teachers accountable for their test scores. And I thought it was ludicrous. And in retrospect, it did turn out to be ludicrous, but it was widely shared. And I wrote many, many columns trying to explain why I thought it was ludicrous. And I won't go into too many of them, but for example, uh, I wrote, remember writing a column about asthma. As you may know, low-income black children in urban areas in this country have asthma at about four times the rate of middle-class children, four times the rate. And if a child has asthma, the child may be up at night wheezing. Not every child, but many of them. Sleepless, drowsy when they come to school the next day. And I tried to explain that if you had two groups of children, you don't need a lot of sophistical, statistical sophistication to understand this. If you have two groups of children that are identical in every respect, same racial breakdown, same social and economic background, same family structure, same in everything you can imagine except one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group is going to have lower average achievement no matter how hard teachers try, because teachers can't try hard to make children wide awake if they come to school drowsy. And you can go through social and economic condition after social and economic condition that is experienced by low-income, predominantly African-American children in this country, whether it's asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or family economic insecurity because of unemployment, and do the same kind of exercise to identical groups of children, Every one of them will make a contribution to the achievement gap. When you've added them all up, you've explained most of it. Well, this is what I was writing about and, and uh, thinking about, was all of the social and economic conditions that produce lower average achievement for African-American children. 
And, you know, I'm a slow learner, but fortunately I've been around long enough that it takes me, I have enough time to learn new things, and I gradually figured out there's one thing if a child comes to school with asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or a family economic insecurity, but what happens when you have a school where every child or many children have one or more of these conditions? How can a school like that ever be expected to achieve at the same level as schools where children come to school healthy and well-rested and not poisoned by lead and in secure homes? It's obviously not possible to conceive of that kind of result. And we call those kinds of schools where we concentrate children with those kinds of disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And, like I said, it took me a while, but I gradually realized that those segregated schools are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. In fact, we have a greater level of school segregation in this country today than we've had at any time in the last 50 years. More school segregation today than we've had at any time in the last 50 years because the neighborhoods are so segregated. So I began to think that maybe residential segregation was an educational problem. That's how I came to the research that uh, led to the book that I'm talking about this evening. I initially knew nothing about housing policy, and I'm ashamed to say cared even less. I was only writing about education. And then in 2007, because I was writing about education, I read a Supreme Court decision that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the Supreme Court evaluated a, um, a program in Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Uh, both of those districts had a very, very minor, trivial desegregation plan. Uh, they gave parents the choice of which school in the district their child would attend. But the district said that if the choice was going to further intensify racial segregation of the schools, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who would not intensify the segregation. So if you had a, a, an all-white school, a mostly white school, and there was one place left in the school, and both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child would be given some preference. Trivial, trivial program. How often do you have one place left in the school? and both a black and a white child have to be chosen, one or the other has to be chosen. Trivial program, but the Supreme Court denounced it, said it was unconstitutional to do such a thing. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the plurality opinion, the controlling opinion, and he explained that it's true, he said, uh, the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. But he said the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. I thought that was a pretty wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. That's, in fact, why they're segregated. And he went on to explain that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated de facto, the term he used. De facto because of private bigotry or actions of the private economy or self-choice or income differences. And he said we have de facto segregation, segregation that wasn't created by government. Government is not permitted to take explicit action to undo it. Well, <clears throat> I read this decision, and I remembered some years before a case in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the two school districts that was involved in the Supreme Court decision. In Louisville, Kentucky, there was an all-white suburb outside Louisville called Shively, um, single-family homes, all white. There was a white homeowner in that suburb called Shively had a friend, who African-American friend, living in the center city of Louisville, renting an apartment, decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and daughter, had a middle-class job, wanted to move to a single-family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner bought a second home in this suburb and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved into this home, an angry mob of white neighbors surrounded the home, protected by the police, they threw rocks through the windows. The police would not, did not do anything to stop it. They eventually firebombed and dynamited the home, and the police took no action to interfere. But when the riot was all over, uh, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year jail sentence the white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the courts are being used to maintain racial boundaries in Louisville, 
And I began to look into it a little bit more deeply. And in the course of it, I discovered that um, this wasn't an isolated incident. And I'm not exaggerating when I use these words. There were thousands of incidents of mob violence driving African Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods in the mid 20th century. We've forgotten all of them. Many of them were police protected, sometimes police led, sometimes police instigated. Every one of those was a civil rights violation, violation of our Constitution, of the 14th Amendment, that we have an obligation to redress, but have never been redressed. And when I went, looked into it a bit further, I discovered that it wasn't just police protected, court enforced violence that created the residential segregation, the apartheid conditions that we know today in this country, but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies that created, enforced, sustained racial segregation, every one of which was a civil rights violation, every one of which we have an obligation as American citizens to, to remedy, each one of us. Well, let me spend some time, uh, a little bit of time this evening, describing just a couple of those policies. Uh, I don't have time to go into very many of them, but there were many, many at the federal, state, and local level. I'll just uh, restrict myself to a couple of federal policies. Uh, one of them, public housing. And you hear public housing, and I know what you think. You think public housing is a place where poor people live. It's a place with lots of single mothers with children, lots of young men, maybe without jobs in the formal economy, getting engaged in confrontations with the police deteriorated buildings. That's our image of public housing today. It's not how public housing began in this country. The first civilian public housing in this country was built during the Depression and the New Deal. The Franklin Roosevelt administration, the Public Works administration built the first civilian public housing in this country. It was um, not for poor people. Poor people were not permitted into public housing because they couldn't afford to pay the full cost of the housing and their rent. The government wasn't subsidizing the housing, it was just building it and recouping the costs in rent. We had a 25% unemployment rate at the time in the Depression. Public housing was for the 75% who had jobs, good employment, stable employment records. The Public Works Administration, the first New Deal agency, built that housing, public housing, and it segregated it everywhere it built it in the country, creating separate projects for African Americans and for whites. Frequently, frequently segregating neighborhoods that hadn't previously been segregated. Integrated neighborhoods. That may surprise some of you, but in mid 20th century America, we had lots of urban integration in this country. We had urban integration for the simple reason that uh, we were a manufacturing economy. None of this internet stuff going on. It was all manufacturing, making things. And factories had to be located either near a deep water port or a railroad terminal in order to get their parts and ship their final products. They couldn't be spread out over the countryside. We had no highways, no trucking to speak of. So if you had a factory district that employed both African Americans and whites and others, it had to be located in the same broad area, central area. It had to be able to walk to work, maybe take short streetcar rides. Um, created lots of integration. The first public works administration project to be built, the first public housing to be built in this country was in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta had segregated schools, segregated water fountains, segregated buses, had integrated housing neighborhoods because of the reason I just described. The economy couldn't work unless people lived close enough to be able to walk to work. The public works administration demolished housing in that neighborhood called the Flats outside downtown, Los Angeles, uh, downtown Atlanta and built a project for whites only forcing the African Americans who were living in that neighborhood to double up with relatives, find less adequate housing elsewhere. This was the pattern everywhere. There were projects built for African Americans as well, not as many as for whites, but always segregated. Uh, the great African American poet, novelist, playwright Langston Hughes, whom I hope many of you are familiar with, wrote in his autobiography that he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. We don't think of downtown Cleveland today as being an integrated place, but that's where he says he grew up. He says his best friend in high school was Polish. He says he dated a Jewish girl in high school. You wouldn't find that surprising in an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. But the Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood of Cleveland, demolished housing, and built two separate projects, one for African Americans and one for whites, 
creating a pattern of segregation with that and other projects in Cleveland that exists to this day. Sustaining and perpetuating and reinforcing whatever informal segregation might have existed in parts of Cleveland. Uh, in my book, uh, <clears throat> some of you I know have read it. Uh, you may recall that where I can, I like to pick on self-satisfied, smug places that think they're better than you are. Um, one of my favorites is Cambridge, Massachusetts. You've probably heard of it. Um, the area between Harvard and MIT, the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s, about half black and half white. But the federal government built two projects in the Central Square neighborhood, one for blacks, a separate one for whites, creating segregation with that, <coughs> excuse me, with those projects and with others elsewhere in the Boston area that persists to this day. During World War II, the federal government's efforts to create segregation with its housing programs continued. <coughs> Excuse me. In that period, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in war industries, so jobs that hadn't existed during the Depression. They overwhelmed the communities where these war plants were located. If the government wanted the tanks and the jeeps and the aircraft carriers and the ships to be produced. <clears throat> it had to create housing for these migrants, both black and white. <clears throat> and it did so. Everywhere, everywhere that we had war plants, the federal government created housing for war workers, always on a segregated basis, separate housing for blacks, separate housing for whites, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. And the West Coast is a good example of this because those of you who know urban history and will know that the great migration of African Americans out of the former slave-holding states into the rest of the country didn't reach the West Coast until the second great migration during World War II. So there were very few African Americans living on the West Coast. There were some. Some had come to the West Coast during the gold rush, um, but very few living on the West Coast prior to the great migration of African Americans to take jobs in the war plants. Hundreds of thousands coming to California, to Portland, to uh, Seattle. The government built segregated housing everywhere for workers, black and white, who were working in the same war industry, or same plants sometimes, always segregating them, creating segregation where it never had existed before and where it never would have grown up were it not for the war strategy of the federal government. In San Francisco, Another one of those self-satisfied smug places, uh, the federal government built five public housing projects, four of them for whites only, one for African Americans, creating the African American ghetto of San Francisco. And in Seattle, in Portland, in Los Angeles, you all heard of Watts. Watts was a white neighborhood until the federal government decided to put its housing for African American war workers in Watts, and then it became the designated black area of Los Angeles in all of these places segregated for the first time by um, federal policy during the war. After the war, after the war, there was still an enormous housing shortage. Millions of returning war veterans coming home needing housing. Very little had been built during the Depression except for those few public projects that I mentioned. Uh, no construction was going on to speak of. Uh, during World War II, it was against the law to use construction materials for civilian purposes unless it was for war workers. So there was no housing being built then either, except for those workers. And then as I said, millions, millions of returning war veterans are coming home. Some of you were descended from them. They came home needing to start the baby boom and no place to start it. So the government had to solve this enormous housing shortage that similar to the housing crisis that we have today. Uh, the private sector wasn't building any housing for working class families. Only the affluent were being served by the private sector in the housing market. So President Truman, who succeeded Roosevelt after the war, proposed a vast expansion of the nation's public housing program. Now remember, public housing was, most des was the most desirable housing available at that time to middle class, working class families. It was not for poor people. He proposed a vast expansion of the public housing program to take, the, take care of the needs of returning war veterans. Conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's 1949 Housing Act. Not for racial reasons, it was segregated, they didn't mind that. It's not because they didn't like poor people, they didn't, but that wasn't the reason, because poor people weren't admitted into public housing for, 
for the most part. They wanted to defeat it because they thought that public housing was socialistic. The private sector, they said, should be taking care of the housing needs of war veterans, returning war veterans, even though the private sector wasn't doing it, just as the private sector today is not creating housing for working class and middle class families. But they wanted to defeat it, so they came up with a strategy that uh, the term that's most commonly used for is a poison pill strategy. Uh, some of you may have heard the term. A poison pill strategy in Congress is one where opponents of a bill, uh, as the conservatives oppose the Housing Act, opponents of the bill come up with an amendment to the bill, which they think can get a majority. And when the amendment is passed, and then the full bill comes up before the House and the Senate, a different majority then finds the bill unpalatable because of that amendment. So the amendment is called a poison pill amendment. And conservatives in Congress, some of you may remember this name, others of you may have read it, uh, led by the Mr. Conservative, his name was Senator Taft from Ohio, proposed an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act as follows. From now on, public housing has to be non-discriminatory, no more racial discrimination in public housing. No more of the segregation stuff. We've got to have non-discriminatory public housing. They plan to vote for this amendment. They thought that they could get some northern liberals to vote for it as well. That would create a majority, the conservatives and the northern liberals. The amendment would pass. And then when the full bill came up on the floor of the House and the Senate, the conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by southern Democrats who were in favor of segregated public housing, but not non-discriminatory public housing, and the entire bill will go down to defeat. It was a cynical strategy on the part of the conservatives in proposing this amendment. They didn't want public housing at all, but that was their strategy for defeating it. Liberals had a tough choice. And I'm going into the story in some detail because it is exactly uh, the um, dilemma that we face today, the choice we face today. In the reception before this talk, I heard a lot of references to affordable housing, our crisis of affordable housing today. Keep in mind that affordable housing and non-segregated housing are not the same thing. Liberals had a difficult choice in 1949. Were they going to support this amendment or not? They decided to oppose the non-discrimination amendment in order to preserve public housing, in order to defeat the conservatives' poison pill strategy. The leading liberal in the Senate at that time was a senator from Illinois. His name was Paul Douglas. His closest colleague was a, a senator whose name you probably do remember. He was a, a senator from Minnesota. He was called Mr. Civil Rights. His name was Hubert Humphrey. They campaigned against the integration amendment. Senator Douglas got up on the floor of the Senate and made a speech along the following lines. He said, I want to say to my Negro friends that you'll be better off if this integration amendment is defeated and you get the housing that you need, then you will be if the integration amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. Well, he persuaded his colleagues to vote against the integration amendment, the non-discrimination amendment. It was defeated. The full housing act was passed as a, not, as a continued segregated program. We got the vast expansion of public housing that we know today. In retrospect, I, I'm not minimizing the difficulty of the choice that Paul Douglas and his colleagues made, but I'm not sure we're better off as a result of that decision. It's true, there was enormous suffering as a result of the housing crisis. Returning war veterans, living in open fields, black and white, uh, double, tripled up with relatives, unable to find housing. But the result of that choice that Douglas and his colleagues made was not only the achievement gap in schools that I began by describing, by concentrating in single places the most disadvantaged African-American children, not only health disparities between blacks and whites, where blacks have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease from living in less healthy neighborhoods, not only the mass incarceration disproportionately affecting young black men, that couldn't happen in the way it is if we weren't concentrating the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to jobs or opportunity. And I think another consequence of the bargain that Douglas made is the very frightening to me, and I'm sure to many of you, uh, dangerous 
political polarization that we have in this country today. It's not entirely racial, but it tracks racial lines fairly closely. How can we ever hope to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to understand each other's life experiences, to empathize with each other, to develop the kind of common national identity that's necessary to a democratic society? Those are the consequences of the choice that we made then, and we're making the same choice today. I'll come to that in a few minutes. Under the expansion of the 1949 Housing Act, all of the giant towers that we're familiar with were uh, built, public housing towers. Uh, you're familiar with some of them. Uh, you've heard of Robert Taylor Homes or Cabrini Green or uh, the pruitt Igo Towers. Have you heard of those in St. Louis? Um, uh, You've heard that term, some of you have at least. It was, it's actually a misleading term. There was no such thing as the pruitt Igo project. It was two separate projects. Pruitt was for African Americans. Igo was for whites. Not because whites happened to like the way Igo sounded and Pruitt like, you know, was rang true to African Americans so they self-segregated. This was explicitly racially designated projects. This was done all over the country and very soon something happened that was quite surprising to housing experts, the public policy experts of all kinds. All the white projects, places like IGO in St. Louis, developed large numbers of vacancies. All the black projects had long waiting lists. These were all returning war veterans, had jobs in the post-war economy. They could afford housing. Why was there such an imbalance between the black and the white projects? Pretty soon, the situation became so conspicuous, so untenable that even the most bigoted public housing official couldn't justify it, so all the projects were opened up to African Americans. And soon public housing became, in most parts of the country, a predominantly African American institution. Once that happened, something else took place around the same period of American history, and that is <clears throat> the factories that I was talking about a few minutes ago no longer needed to be located near deep water ports, near railroad terminals. Because in the 1950s, 1940s, the highways were being built. Trucks could now transport parts and ship final products. And factories could spread out, not have to have elevators going up and down between floors of assembly lines. So jobs disappeared from the central city areas where the public housing was mostly located. They went out to rural areas, to the suburbs where the factories were now located. Once that happened, Residents of public housing became poorer and poorer. They could no longer pay the full cost of the housing and their rent as they had been doing before. The government had to start subsidizing public housing. It became a welfare program for poor people. Once that happened, the government stopped investing in it, stopped maintaining it. They started to deteriorate. And we got the kind of urban slums that we associate with public housing today. It was no longer housing for middle class families. Well, the question is, <clears throat> And I'm sure that those of you who've read the book know the answer to this question. It's no surprise. Uh, but why did all those vacancies develop in the white projects and not in the black ones? And that was because of another federal program that was equally powerful, probably more powerful, in creating segregation in this country than the various iterations of public housing. And that was a program of the Federal Housing Administration, a racially explicit program to move the white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in the suburbs. This was an explicit racial program. Nothing unintended about it. Uh, you're familiar again with all the suburbs that were created in the 1940s and 50s under this massive program. We weren't a suburban country before that. The only people living in suburbs were again the affluent prior to this period. The suburbs became a working class middle class phenomenon only because of this explicit program of the Federal Housing Administration to move white families out of cities. Uh, the suburbs uh, you're familiar with, uh, the biggest one probably was Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, you've heard of that, I assume. Uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, uh, the, the project called Westlake, uh, as big as, as Levittown. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, Lakewood, uh, uh, almost as big as Levittown. And in every metropolitan area um, in between, these suburbs developed in the 40s and 50s. I'm sure that's true here in Portland as well, although um, you'll forgive me, I, I, 
I'm traveling all over the country. I cannot know the specific history of every community that I go to. I wish I could, but um, I urge you to research uh, this community's history. You'll find that these suburbs were created, not as big as Levittown, obviously, but here as well. A builder like Levitt, or the builder of Westlake in San Francisco, his name was Henry Dolger, or any of the others, um, could never have assembled the capital to build these giant suburbs. Levittown was 17,000 homes in one place. 17,000 homes in one place. No buyers, just an idea that Levitt had. What bank would be crazy enough to lend a developer the money to build 17,000 homes in one place for which he had no buyers? That's a rhetorical question. No bank would be crazy enough to lend them the money. The only way that this suburb could be built was Levitt went to the Federal Housing Administration, submitted his plans for the development, and all these other developers did the same. The architectural design of the homes, the materials, construction materials are going to be used, the layout of the streets, and an explicit commitment never to sell a home to an African American. The Federal Housing Administration even required a clause placed in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. And if any of you live in homes that were built in the mid 20th century or before, I know people never look at their deeds when they buy a home, but look at your deeds. I guarantee that many of you are living in homes that are for Caucasians only. This was a Federal Housing Administration requirement. Well, it wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats, as I say. It was written out in the policy manual that the Federal Housing Administration used. It was distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate applications of builders for federal guarantees of bank loans to build single-family homes. Uh, the federal manual said explicitly that you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a, uh, a development that wouldn't have the same racial class, not that any were built for African Americans to speak of, but the manual even went so far you couldn't build a house, build a development for whites only if it were located near where African Americans were living because in the words of the manual, and I'm quoting here, it would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. Where did this de facto notion come from? It's utter nonsense. There's no basis in reality to it whatsoever. Of course there was private bigotry in this country. Levitt was a bigot. If left to his own devices, he would not have sold to African Americans. But he wasn't left to his own devices. He couldn't have built a project on his own for whites only. The only way he could build his project was by, getting, was by getting a Federal Housing Administration guarantee, and the Federal Housing Administration violated its Fifth Amendment responsibilities by conditioning that guarantee on racial exclusion. Well, what are the consequences of this policy? The white families who bought those homes in the mid-20th century, they were inexpensive at the time. Most of them were small, 750 square feet in the initial Levittown development. They sold for $8,000, $9,000 at the time. And today's money, that's about a little bit less than $100,000. Today, uh, I don't know what you think homes in Levittown sell for today, but I can tell you it's not $100,000. Uh, those homes now sell for you know, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars in some parts of the country they sell for a million dollars or more. The white families who bought those homes gained over the next few generations wealth from the appreciation and the value of those homes. If the homes now sell for five hundred thousand dollars, that's a four hundred thousand gain in wealth. They use that wealth to send their children to college. They use it to take care of Perhaps emergencies, maybe temporary unemployment. If you have wealth, you can afford to lose a job for a little while until you find another one. If you don't have wealth, you're pushed further down the social and economic scale if you're living from paycheck to paycheck. They used it to subsidize their own retirements, and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans who were prohibited by explicit federal policy from participating in this program gained none of that wealth. Today, African American incomes are 60% of white incomes on average. There's a whole story behind that. You'll have to invite me back some other time to tell that. I'm not going to go into it. It's a, but it's a similar story behind the income gap. But just take my word for it. There's a 60% income gap. 60, African American families on average have 60% of the incomes of whites. And you'd think, 
So if people have similar incomes, they'd have similar wealth. So you'd expect there to be a 60% wealth ratio as well. But in fact, while African-American incomes are 60% of white incomes on average, African-American wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century and that we, every one of us in this room, has never taken upon ourselves the obligation to remedy. Well, I could go on and on with other federal, state, and local policies. I don't have time for it this evening, but uh, let me say this. The policies today to redress segregation are well known. Housing experts know all about what we should do. There's no mystery about it. We don't need more research about what to do. What's missing is the kind of civil rights movement we had in the 1960s that's going to make it uncomfortable to maintain the apartheid patterns that we have in this country today. I can go into a you know, what the policies are. Uh, I, I sometimes hesitate to do it because I don't think that's the point. Uh, we don't have the kind of political movement, the kind of pressure to force the enactment of those policies. I'll give you an extreme example. I don't, I'm certainly not putting this something forward as, uh, that would be politically realistic even in the near future if we had a civil rights movement, but those homes that I just described in the mid-20th century that the Federal Housing Administration created for whites only and sold for about $100,000 in today's money, now selling for $500,000. That's a constitutional violation, as I described, doing that. How do you remedy it? Well, the way to remedy it is for the federal government to be buying up homes in these suburbs for $500,000, market rate, whatever they are, and reselling them to qualified African Americans for $100,000. That's a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. There are many, many other less extreme policies all un politically unrealistic. I mentioned before that uh, we're facing the same dilemma that Paul Douglas faced in 1949. We're concentrating with our public policies segregation, reinforcing it. We no longer need racially explicit policies like they had in the 1940s, because once we create these segregated patterns, uh, neutral policies can persist, can maintain them, reinforce them. So for example, we have a program today that builds affordable housing. Not enough of it, low-income housing. It's called the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit. It's something that's uh, administered by the Federal Treasury Department. They issue tax credits to states to be given to developers to build affordable housing. The Treasury Department regulations place a priority on placing that housing in low-income segregated neighborhoods. They don't say segregated, they just say low-income neighborhoods on the theory that that's going to make those neighborhoods healthier by, and these are my words, by segregating them more. That's got it backwards. But we're not going to reverse that set of priorities. Not that we shouldn't build some affordable housing in low-income neighborhoods to try to revitalize those neighborhoods a bit, but that's not where we should be placing most of our affordable housing. We should be placing most of our affordable housing in high-opportunity communities where people have access to jobs and healthy food and uh, healthy air. Um, uh, the Section 8 program, operates similarly. It's a voucher program. Uh, uh, families are given subsidies to rent apartments uh, in, in uh, their communities, in their metropolitan areas, and the overwhelming number of Section 8 vouchers are being used in already low-income segregated neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation, because landlords typically won't accept them outside those neighborhoods. So the only place to use them, and it's not illegal, by the way, to refuse, even though we have a Fair Housing Act, it's not illegal to refuse to accept a Section 8 voucher holder. That's got it backwards as well. We should make it against the law to refuse to accept a Section 8 voucher holder, and we should re enforce it if we make it um, against the, the, if we make it a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, there are many, many other policies we could follow. Perhaps the most important one is suburbs today, many white, exclusively white suburbs, or overwhelmingly white suburbs, maintain their segregation. They don't need racially explicit rules anymore. They have zoning ordinances that prohibit the construction of anything but single family homes on large lot sizes, ensuring that no affordable housing, I'm not just talking for poor people, no affordable housing for working class or middle class families can be built in their communities, effectively perpetuating those communities' segregation. In my view, I'm not a lawyer, but I talk to a lot of lawyers and nobody's ever challenged me on this. Um, in my view, uh, 
a zoning ordinance that prohibits anything from single family homes on large lot sizes from being built in the community is unconstitutional because it reinforces an unconstitutionally created segregation. We should ban such zoning ordinances. But none of these things are possible today <clears throat> because we don't have the kind of civil rights movement that we had in the 1960s. And as you can see, I'm an old man. It's not up to me to create the civil rights movement. It's up to you. And um, I am confident, hopeful, that uh, as the discussion of this kind of thing increases, as it is in the society today, such a civil rights movement will emerge, and we will finally address this most serious expression of racial segregation in our society. So thank you very much for your attention, and I guess we'll take some questions, right? If you have questions, you can come to the mics, and I'd be glad to spend 15 minutes answering them. To the extent, and let me say one other thing before I start. Um, I'm not hiding. My email address is all over the web. And if uh, I don't have time for your questions, feel free to send them to me on email. I don't promise to answer them the next day, but I will get to them eventually. Go ahead. Big thank you um, for all your work. Uh, I know you stand on the shoulders of other giants who've done the work before you, but the fact that you distilled it uh, for this time, uh, for this era, is great, and I thank you. Two quick questions. Um, one is, you know, we, lo we love sequels in America, so I don't know if you uh, are working with anybody to try and, because you must have gotten such a, a response to your, to your first edition, whether there's going to be some kind of follow-up, because you probably have gotten so many people who want to add to what you've started. I don't know if that's possible uh, for you or for anybody that you could set in motion uh, to come after you, but I would definitely buy it and read it. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm also curious, uh, the Chief Justice uh, vacations, has several vacation homes in Maine, and I'm curious if you, um, if you ever think that the Supreme Court will revisit um, this, or if you're aware of any act, active efforts to attempt to revisit um, the jurisprudence um, today uh, with respect to, you know, basically that, that school segregation decision as it relates to de facto versus uh, de jure uh, housing segregation. Well, there's not a long line at these microphones, so I'll forgive you for asking three questions. Uh, <laughs> let me, uh, I'll take each one of them. Yes, you're right. I stand on the shoulders of people who have done this. The, there is very little original in my book, In the Color of Law. Um, it's called A Forgotten History because it was once well known and it's been written about by scholars for years, although not for the last 25 years. But, um, you know, I was speaking um, uh, before with Libby, and that is you know, about how the, the academics don't write books about big picture things like this. They don't write books about the forests. They just write books about the trees. And I was able to rely on lots of tree books to write this forest book. Uh, and so I didn't invent this. And, and I, I was, I'm not a professional historian, as I told you. Uh, uh, um, I'm not a professional anything. Uh, but um, one of the things I'm proud of, probably most proud of, is this book has been out now for two and a half years, and no professional historian has challenged a single fact in this book. So it's well established. This is a forgotten history, not an unknown history. Uh, your second question about the sequel. Well, so now that you mention it, <laughs> what I've got to do, I am start, I'm working on it, but what I've got to do is stop running around the country giving talks like this so I have time to do some work. And I haven't had time in the last, I've done too much of this. I love being here and I love meeting all of you, but I've done too much of this because I can't. What I'm doing now and this goes a little bit against what I was, uh, how I concluded, but um, the, the book that I talked about this evening was How Segregation Happened. The sequel is what we do about it. And, um, but it's trying to talk about the kinds of policies that I've described and more as a manual for a civil rights movement than as a policy book. Um, but like I say, I have to stop accepting wonderful invitations like this in order to get really serious work on it. The third question, um, you are listening to what I said, at least to all of it. Um, 
I have no expectation that the courts are going to solve this problem unless there are people in the streets making it necessary for them to solve it. So I really don't care what the, the Chief Justice thinks or whether he ever reconsiders his jurisprudence. If you know, and many of you I know are law students, you know that the Supreme Court has flipped back and forth and back and forth on issues of race throughout its history. It's a political issue. It's not, a, you know, that you can, the, their interpretations of the Constitution wave with the wind. And um, uh, so I think that, you know, there was a, a, let me just say this, there was a, um, uh, again, I'm, uh, some of you know more American history than others, but the, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a very, very famous cartoonist uh, whose name was Peter Finley Dunn, columnist and cartoonist. He wrote in magazines all across the country, and his, his sort of thing was to write about a, uh, an Irishman sitting at a bar spouting off aphorisms. The Irishman was named Mr. Dooley, and Mr. Dooley's most famous aphorism is that the Supreme Court follows the election returns. And uh, that's as true today as it was then. And um, I, you know, in, in Brown versus Board of Education would not have happened were it not for returning war veterans uh, coming home having fought against genocide and racial categories. And it became too embarrassing for this country to maintain school segregation. It wasn't because they sat down and studied the Constitution for the first time. So the same thing's going to happen now. Uh, and, uh, or will happen now, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the court will be forced to change, and there's certainly plenty of justification for them to change, but it won't happen spontaneously because they've studied my book or any other like it, in my view. Oh, somebody on this side, that's right, that's the way I'm supposed to do it, right? Okay. So the preface to your sequel, do you have any models for us that we can look to little steps, some communities that have taken to the streets and done some small step to, to be successful. Yes, there are many, many examples of successes. They're all small. None of them have been nationalized or even statewide. Um, in my book, I talk about a couple. Um, Montgomery County, Maryland, which is the, um, a, a suburb of Washington, D.C., very, very affluent county, has a zoning ordinance that requires any developer to set aside 15% of his or her, in the case maybe, units for moderate income families. And then the Montgomery County Public Housing Authority buys 5% of those total units, or a third of the set aside units, for its public housing program. And so it distributes both moderate and low income families throughout the county in new development. It does very little to desegregate the county because most of the county is already built. It's not dependent on new development, but that kind of policy is one. There are many states, not many, there, there are some states that have prohibited discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders, uh, even though uh, it's permitted under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, there's a, I can send you a list of the states that have done it and other uh, localities as well. If you send me a note, I'll send you that list. Um, a good place to get that kind of list, or, or a lot, actually a lot of good examples, is from a website of an organization called the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, PRAC, P-R-R-A-C. And if you go to the PRAC web, website, you'll find a list of, of communities that have prohibited discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders. Can you repeat that name? Yes, P-R-R-A-C dot org, the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. P-R-R-A-C dot org. Um, what other examples? Um, well, uh, New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, has a fair share plan which requires every jurisdiction to have a fair share of its metropolitan area's low-income population to be building housing. It, it can't use race because the current Supreme Court won't let it use race, but disproportionately, uh, low-income people in New Jersey are, are, not most of them, but disproportionately are, are African-American, and so this has helped to desegregate communities in New Jersey. Massachusetts has a somewhat more complicated and less well-enforced law called 40B, but it allows communities to get out of their obligation, but it's still a step in the right direction. So those are some examples of, of positive steps in the right direction, uh, uh, but they're, they're relatively few. Um, my question is about the persistence of, um, of um, you, you just, um, discrimination. So is, 
would that be far-fetched if I, I ask that the persistence comes from civil rights instead of human rights? Because asking to be treated with civility is a little bit different to ask it to be treated with equality. So um, I don't know if I'm, I'm clear. Well, you're asking about the persistence of discrimination? Yeah, and segregation. Does it come with the fact that the fight was about civil rights, people asking to be treated with civility instead of human rights, that ask people to be treated equally? Well, to the extent I, ask, ask, I understand your question, let me take two parts. First, discrimination certainly persists. There is a, a fantastic <clears throat> investigative report just done, done just a couple of weeks ago by Newsday, Long Island newspaper Newsday, in which they um, spent an enormous amount of money hiring what are called testers, in which they got blacks and whites who are identical, matched pairs, to um, go separately to real estate agents looking for homes, and showed uh, that uh, um, the African Americans were steered away from white neighborhoods uh, not always, but much too often. There have been lots of studies like that, but the unique thing about the Newsday um, investigative report is they actually, they had little uh, buttonhole cameras and they filmed the actual real estate agents and named them, which was uh, fantastic. And if you have a, an enterprising newspaper in this state, they ought to do the same thing. So there is ongoing discrimination, but as I said before, um, you don't need ongoing discrimination to perpetuate these policies. Even if we had no ongoing discrimination, we would still have segregation. Because once we establish these community boundaries, um, they persist uh, for one reason, if not, and, and this is just only one reason, the wealth gap that I talked about before, which has to be remedied before we can fix this problem. So not discriminating against people who can't afford to move to single family homes in the suburbs, it doesn't accomplish very much. So both are necessary. We need to end discrimination and we need to, um, aggressively redress the segregation that's already um, occurred. Uh, I focus on civil rights, not human rights, because I want to um, uh, appeal to you to um, accept your constitutional obligations to do something about this as American citizens. Um, the human rights is an important concept. It's something I believe in, we all believe in. But civil rights is something we don't have a choice about believing in or not. We have an obligation, if we take our citizenship seriously, to enforce it. Uh, hi, thank you very much for, <coughs> excuse me, a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, one little bit of history locally, uh, and then I'll ask a quick question, if that's okay. Uh, you mentioned the uh, public housing built as a result of World War II, uh, and I know you're not from around here, but for the audience, and for you, we had a big shipyard in South Portland that built uh, thousands of Liberty ships during World War II. Red Bank, the housing project or development in South Portland, and Sagamore Village on Brighton Avenue across from Lowe's, and I believe Forest Gardens housing directly behind CVS, 300 yards from here, were all built to house the workers that worked at the shipyard. And today, I believe there are at least two out of the three, I believe they're public housing section eight, uh, two of those three uh, communities, Red Banks and Sagamore Village. I'm not certain about Forest Gardens here. But my well, well, boy, let me ask you a question. Were there African-American workers at the shipyards? I don't believe okay, there were. Yeah, Maine not, is, is I a, don't believe there were, yeah. I'm not an expert. But, <laughs> I don't believe there were very many. Yeah. Uh, I, I, back in the 60s, I went to uh, uh, Portland High School, and I believe, I'm pulling a figure a little bit out of the air, there might have been 10, yeah. maybe 20 yeah, no. African-American <clears throat> students uh, at Portland High School. Uh, so right. there were, I, I don't yeah. think there were a lot. I think, yeah, if, if I were looking for African-American World War II shipyard record workers, I wouldn't come to Portland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my question <laughs> is, who was behind this policy? Ah. Who was behind well, it, either at the federal level or in the, pub, uh, the private sector, the well, banks, uh, Wall Street? Who was promoting this policy? And I'm assuming the result was to keep us divided, to well, play one okay. group against another. 
but there had to be somebody pulling the strings behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> you know, certainly, as I, I indicated in my talk, the banks and the realtors were bigots and operated in a discriminatory fashion. But without the federal government structuring that discrimination, it couldn't have happened. So when you ask who is behind it, you know, the federal government, in the, in the examples I gave, was behind it. Why? Well, this country never has dealt with the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow. And out of the Jim Crow era, and, you know, uh, Henry Louis Gates has done a documentary on this. Uh, I urge you to watch it. Out of the Jim Crow era, we developed in this country a culture, a caste culture, in which African Americans were labeled as being inferior to whites. This didn't stem from the Civil War. It was after, it was the 20th century. It was the Jim Crow era where this evolved. And we've never dealt with it. Um, I know we have limited time, but I love this story so much I have to tell it. I'm sorry. I just... Uh, you know, and I, I, do, I, I do talk about this in the book. You know, the first Southerner, Southern Democrat, elected to the presidency of the United States after the Civil War was Woodrow Wilson. He was elected in 1912, took office in 1913. He was from South Carolina, Virginia, segregationist, militant segregationist. He had moved to New Jersey and was governor of New Jersey, but he was a Southerner and a segregationist, a militant segregationist. When he took office in 1913, he embarked on a program to segregate the federal civil service. The federal civil service prior to 1913 was integrated, fully integrated. Um, there were black and white, you know, it wasn't a giant civil service. Uh, the federal government was small, but there were offices in Washington with black and white workers. Um, the, uh, under the Wilson administration beginning in 1913, they put up curtains to separate black and white clerical workers. They required uh, African Americans to use washrooms in the basements of buildings that they constructed for that purpose. African Americans who were fired throughout the civil service if they were in a position of supervising whites because that was no longer permitted. This was not after the Civil War. This was beginning in 1913. The civil service had been integrated before that. Well, one of the biggest federal departments in 1913 was the Navy Department. And the official responsible for segregating the Naval Department was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. All right, now here's a quiz. No, if you've read the book, don't raise your hand. But <laughs> Who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1913? Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt. All right. Now, I'm not suggesting that it was Franklin Roosevelt's idea to segregate the Navy Department or that he would have done it on his own, but he didn't object. This was part of the environment, the political culture in which he matured, and those, these were the assumptions that he accepted. That's my answer to the question. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <I, clears throat> um, I guess kind of related, one of the things I've always been confused about when learning about this stuff is like, I guess kind of why, in the sense that I know like the creation of suburbia, there's a very Cold War aspect to it of like creating a petty bourgeois mentality in the American worker by making him a homeowner. But I always wondered like why that had to be a whites only project. And I guess similarly, like why were public housing you know, why were the public housing projects segregated in previously integrated neighborhoods? Was it just, um, was it just that like the developers were racist and people didn't want to push back on them? Or was it like, I don't know, I guess like I've never understood sort of why they did, like it's just always seemed a little unnecessary. Well, I, I, that was my last question. I answered that. This was the assumption of uh, the Democratic Party at the time, which was progressive on economic issues, but um, had a caste mentality when it came to race. And they just, um, they, it's not that there, were, there was no opposition to it. There certainly was opposition to it. Um, uh, the NACP, for example, uh, despite the enormous costs that were involved, opposed Paul Douglas's opposition to the um, non-discrimination amendment. So there was opposition to it. The biggest opposition perhaps came from the president's own wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, who, as she became more and more exposed to African Americans during his presidency, became more aggressive in trying to persuade him to change some of these policies. But this was a, the general assumption of the Democratic Party. Um, okay. I guess sort of like my confusion is that, like, you know, the government was able to 
see, understand that like one of the reasons it had to move on civil rights was because it was good propaganda for the Soviet Union. And why couldn't they come to that realization for housing policy? Well, I can't tell you why they couldn't, but they didn't. So, yeah. Okay, last question. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's all been very inspiring. I wanted to let you know that the city of Portland's undertaking a comprehensive uh, overhaul of its zoning ordinance, the recode process. And as the city of Portland um, goes through uh, and, and re-examines its zoning, uh, wanted to hear from you recommendations, advice um, on topics that we as the community should be focused on um, or looking to draw inspiration from other communities, Montgomery County, Maryland, or Minneapolis, which recently banned single family zoning. Just wanted to hear your advice. Yeah, let me say briefly, I, I, I threw this line out before, but I'll say it again. Affordable housing and non-segregated housing are not the same thing. And we can make the same mistake that Paul Douglas and his colleagues made um, by thinking that they're the same thing. Uh, Minneapolis, as you said, uh, abolished single-family zoning throughout the city. But without um, explicitly requiring inclusionary zoning, the likely result is more market rate condominiums for young professionals who can't find housing in the city. We have a housing crisis today that affects not only the poor and not only minorities, but middle class professional workers who can't afford to live in the communities where they work. We're generating lots of internet and, gen and, and professional employment, but not housing for those people. So if we simply expand the supply of housing by upzoning, which we need to do, but if that's all we do, we won't do anything to redress segregation because the first people who will be taken care of by race neutral policies will be the people in the upper levels and not the people who are suffering at the lower levels of our social structure. So I guess the only thing I have to say to you is you have to be explicit about your racial intent, which is hard to do, but there are ways, there are ways around it, um, uh, it under the current Supreme Court doctrine. You have to be explicit about your racial intent and certainly about your class intent, intent because upzoning alone will not do anything to address this problem. By upzoning, I mean um, zoning uh, for more density uh, in, in communities. Well, thank you again very much for your attention. I really appreciate being invited here.